What's up everybody? Welcome back to One More Guitar. Thank you for checking out the video. Today I want to talk about the new Get Back documentary by Peter Jackson about the Beatles. If you haven't seen this thing, it covers the time when they were recording the Let It Be album and is a fascinating look at who they were as people and how they worked together. It's a very awesome documentary, but it's also about nine hours long and it's a hard watch at some points. So uh, I wanted to talk about it a little bit and show you the things that I got out of it. Um, there's definitely some cool stuff in there to watch, but like I said, it's a bit long. Uh, if you have the chance to watch it and you're a Beatles fan, I do highly recommend it, but if not, hopefully I can cover some of the highlights of it and let you know some of the things that I found in this video that were really interesting to see. I do want to say if you're planning on watching it, there's some spoilers ahead. I'm not going to lay out the entire thing, but I will kind of set it up so you can understand what I'm talking about in context. And I'm just going to go over the highlights of the things that I really enjoyed about it. So let's check this out. Alright, let's start by talking about where the Beatles were at this point and what led to this project. In 1966, they quit performing live altogether and they focused only on studio albums. But even then, somebody would come in and lay down a track and then others would come in and overdub it and they really didn't work together a lot. So at this point of this project, it's been about three years since they played live at all. Now they had done Hey Jude on this TV special and I think that's really what sparked their interest to do this live show in the first place. But somewhere along the line, somebody came up with the idea to do a live show, make an album out of it, and create a documentary around the entire process of making this performance in this album. For some context, these guys were all about 30 years old when they were making this. I think Ringo was a little older, but most of them were still in their late 20s. And really, they were kind of towards the end of their career. I mean, they've achieved so much at this point, it's ridiculous. I don't know what you did by 30, but I can tell you I didn't write that many hit songs. <laughs> it's crazy. So I just want to say that to remember how young they were and how much pressure was probably on them as we talk about this. Uh, you can see how excited they were when they got there about working on the project. And you can see that excitement kind of shifting towards nerves and anxiety as they actually started working out the songs. When they started playing, it was really rough. Everybody had a few songs that they brought to the table, but nobody had worked them out with anybody else. That part of the video is definitely hard to watch. I mean, they started with basically nothing. And it's really fascinating to see how much they get done in this one month window. There are a lot of big ideas being thrown around about where and how to do this live show. I mean, it's the Beatles after all, so they wanted it to be huge. But uh, some of the ideas got a little ridiculous. At one point they were talking about renting a boat and carrying people to another country to watch the Beatles perform. And you could tell that John and George were getting a little bit nervous about how big this project was growing just right out of the gate. And let me talk about each band member real quick and tell you what I saw in their personalities. Um, I will give a disclaimer here that, you know, again, they were in their late 20s. There was a little bit of arrogance. There was a little bit of not being able to talk to each other and communicate things out. But I think that's just kind of all part of it, especially being in the situation that they were in. Uh, I also think that they called each other out on it a lot. And I don't feel bad about calling it like I see it here and telling you what I saw in their personalities. All right, first we'll start with Paul McCartney. The first thing I noticed about Paul is that Paul was concerned with being Paul McCartney and being in the Beatles. I think that he knew that the Beatles were bigger than him, but I think he also felt the pressure of being the great songwriter Paul McCartney, right? He was nervous about playing live because he wanted the world to see the Beatles as they'd always seen them as the greatest rock band. And I felt that he was really taking that pressure on himself. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Paul also had a lot of songs pre-worked out before they started the session. You could tell that he was trying to prepare and he had some ideas, but he'd also arranged them in his head, and I think he'd gotten an idea of exactly how he wanted these songs to be before they even sat in a room together. Paul also said a few things throughout the documentary that you could tell really hurt the other band members' feelings. He was very nonchalant about talking about the Beatles ending. One idea he had for the live show was to get different newscasters from around the world, and after each song, the newscasters give breaking news that's happening in real time, and after the last song, to say, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles have broken up. He also said at one point that this was supposed to be a documentary about making the last Beatles album. Again, he said it in front of everybody and you could tell that this was news to them. You could also tell that Paul was really concerned with the lack of leadership in the band. After Brian Epstein passed away, their previous manager, he mentions in there that there's nobody to tell us, hey, be here at this time, leave your girlfriends at home, we gotta get work done. I think he was really concerned about getting the work done. And you could tell that not having somebody in that position was really becoming a problem for him because he was trying to take that role on as well as be a songwriter and a band member and a friend to all these people. And the last thing I want to mention about Paul in this documentary is that I noticed before lunch he was very level-headed 
and he had a clear path of what he wanted to do. He was very organized and was making a lot of sense. After lunch every day, he was wild, he was arrogant, and his eyes were bright red. Now you can draw your own conclusions from that, but it seemed to me that, uh, you know, you got a lot more of aggressive Paul after lunch. All right, next we'll talk about George. He was talking about how excited he was that he got to contribute so much to the White Album, and he was telling Paul how he really wanted to add more to this album, and you can tell that it kind of fell on deaf ears. But I will say that George seemed very level-headed to be 25 years old in the making of this. Um, when they were talking about the boat thing, he just kind of shrugged it off, and he was like, you want to rent a boat, and they won't even buy us Fender amps. So I thought that was kind of funny. You can really see him growing as a songwriter too. Throughout the documentary, you see him working on his stuff, bouncing ideas off of John and Paul, and really just honing his craft. All right, next we'll talk about Ringo. I'll be honest, that man looked like he was so bored the entire time. When it was his time to work, he'd get up there, lay down some great drum beats, but most of the time he was just hanging out, letting all these other guys work out all of the songs and work through the drama. And he didn't really get involved in the drama either. And he had some really funny parts in the video too. But I'll say there's a lot of footage of that man just sit back with his eyes closed, just waiting for them to get the song ready, you know? So I thought that was kind of interesting. And it's really awesome just to watch him sit down and come up with these classic, unique drum beats like he's done time after time on their records. Um, that guy really is one of the most underrated drummers in my opinion. Uh, he never repeats himself, and he always comes up with something that's perfect for the song. All right, next we'll talk about John. You could tell he was really nervous and shy at first when they got together. I think that he was a little apprehensive about doing the live show and maybe just wanted to do things the way they'd been doing it. Um, I also got the impression, at least in the first episode, that you know he probably knew the band was ending. He always worked hard trying to get the songs right, gave his input, tried to make the things the best that they could be. But you could see it in his eyes that it seemed like he knew the end was coming. One of the most fascinating things to watch about John in this documentary is his creative process. Man, that guy would try anything to make the song better. He would sing through his teeth like this, he would change the words, he would just do whatever felt natural to him every time they did a new take. He would break into a rock and roll song. Um, it just really was cool to watch him try to figure out the best way to arrange his songs and to write his songs. Another thing I want to mention about John is that it seemed that as much as he was annoyed by Paul's perfectionism and trying to make the album as best as he could, maybe Paul was a little annoyed at how John wanted to keep everything organic and kind of rock and roll. So there's definitely some tension there, but it may have worked in their favor because the pull between each different way may have let them end up with the best possible songs that they could have come up with. That may have been why they worked so well. I want to mention Yoko real quick. I don't think I heard Yoko say a word through this entire documentary. I thought that was crazy. All this time, you know, it was Yoko broke up the band, Yoko broke up the band, but I really didn't see her doing or saying anything. So she seemed like she was there, you know, just to be supportive for John. Now there was one part where Paul said that in the meeting that they don't have on the video where they were trying to talk to George about leaving the band, um, that Yoko was talking for John the entire time. But I didn't see that, and so, you know, I don't know what to say about that. Maybe that's true, maybe she was a lot more outspoken off camera, but I didn't see any of that in this video at all. The last person I want to talk about is Billy Preston. I think when he came in, it made the whole band get their stuff together and get to work. He's a fantastic player and it was really cool to see him come in and, you know, jive with the band. John Lennon even said he wanted to invite him into the band, but Paul said it's hard enough working with four, let's not have five. He showed up even with all of the drama and stuff going on and how much work they were putting into it. He sat there every day and worked with them and I thought that was really cool. Let's talk about the work that they were doing and how they made it through this month. And um, when it started out, it was really rough. Um, each band member had some songs that they brought in. All of them wanted to work on their own songs first. So Paul kind of won out on that and they ended up working on his songs for the first few days. And I really think that rubbed George the wrong way. I think it rubbed John the wrong way too, but he didn't really say anything about it, but you could kind of see it in his demeanor. And I think with all of the pressure of the live show and how they were going to do it, and like I mentioned, all these big ideas going around, I think that really added to the nervousness and the anxiety of the group, and that really made the tensions high. Um, but at one point, Paul is talking to George about a part that he's playing for one of his songs and telling him that he doesn't like it and he wants him to play something different. 
So George says, look, I'll play what you want me to play, but the problem is you don't know what you want me to play. If you did, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So that was really the peak of the tension between George and Paul. But that wasn't when George left, and uh, I found this really interesting. George didn't leave till a few minutes later when Paul kind of blew him off again and then said, is it time for lunch? And, you know, I mentioned earlier, I think Paul was going out and having a little fun at lunch, and uh, I really think that's what pissed George off. I think that's what made him leave is that he knew that when they got back from lunch that it was going to be worse than it was that morning. So that's my take on it anyway. That's what I got out of that. But I found that kind of interesting. So George was gone for a few days, and um, you know they had a meeting off camera to try to talk him back into coming back to the band, and he wouldn't do it. And so they had a few days before they had another meeting with him. And uh, in that time, you know, they sat down and they kept working on these songs, even though the future of the band was uncertain. So it was at this point when they had one of the most interesting things in the entire documentary, and it was a conversation between John and Paul that they didn't know was being recorded. And I have to say that if you're a Beatles fan, you should watch this documentary just for that part or find it on YouTube. I'm sure it's out there. Once they got back to work, they really hit it hard. And again, if you're a big Beatles fan, I definitely recommend going and watching this documentary to see how they worked out these songs basically from nothing to what they ended up with at the end. Which wasn't just the album Let It Be, but basically all of the songs on Abbey Road too. Super impressive to see them work it out. And sometimes they would just goof around, they'd be screaming and yelling and playing just whatever, and just making nonsense up. And somehow it became the songs that we know and love off of Let It Be and Abbey Road. So that was fascinating to watch. It was really inspiring to see how they worked through the songs too. At one point George was working on something and he'd said something in the way she moves attracts me like and he couldn't quite figure out what to put there and John says just put cauliflower anything just say anything and just keep singing it until the right words fall into place but it was really fun to watch them you know try to figure out how to make these songs the best that they could be um, it shows you that they're really willing to put in the time and to try anything to make the song as good as it could be So eventually they got enough songs worked up that they figured they could probably actually do a live show. But at this point they had already canceled the TV special and really didn't have any plans to do anything. At some point in passing, Paul mentioned it'd be funny if they played a show and then got drug out by the cops from somewhere. So later on the producer said, why don't you play a show on the roof of this building? So they started working towards that and they got a few songs together and to me it was really exciting to see them get on that roof after watching them struggle from nothing to get these songs together and get up there and play them live again within a month time frame and uh, when they got up there and started playing they fell right back into place i think that they killed it you could tell that that's where they were happy in this whole thing you know it was really great i thought it was kind of interesting the song choices that they picked um, they didn't do a lot of them and they did several takes they redid several songs over and over again I thought that was kind of odd considering how many other songs they had worked up. You know, maybe they were trying to get takes for the album, so I don't really know what was going on there, but I did find it interesting, their song selection, and how many times they repeated a few of them. Several of the takes of the rooftop performance were actually used on the album. They really were trying to make an album without doing any overdubs, and I think it's killer. I think what they did is fantastic. And the fact that they were able to pull some of the songs off of that rooftop recording and straight up put it on a Beatles album, I mean, that's awesome. Another cool thing to see about the rooftop performance were the police involved. I thought it was so funny that the two police came in and they said, we've had a lot of complaints and the reception was just like, yeah, just wait here. And you hear song after song playing while they're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally they get to go up to the roof and you don't see them again. And then later a sergeant comes in. He's like, do I have any police officers in here? And they're like, yeah, they're on the roof. And he's like, okay. And then he was super polite. He was like, well, may I please go up there? Is it okay if I go up right now? I was like, I don't know. I just was cracking up at these police officers. I thought that was pretty good. That was interesting to watch. So overall, I just found this documentary fascinating, mainly because of how little they had when they started and how much they had at the end of it. Again, it was about a month time frame, and those guys worked through some drama, some trouble. The fact that they haven't played together in so long, all this pressure that's on them, they worked through all of that and not only gave us one great record, but two great records out of it. It's just really, really amazing to see what those guys did. And I think that this is a great historical documentary that can show you an insight into the Beatles that you've never seen before. 
So if you've got the time to watch it, I do highly recommend it. But if not, hopefully I covered some of the highlights for you just so you can get some of the exciting stuff out of it that I saw. So I really appreciate you watching the video. And until next time, take it easy and keep playing.